Good morning, y'all. I love it when people do not know how to pronounce my name. That is the correct approach. It's Lisa Galof to her. Thank you. So as many of you know, if you were here last year, Mikey Dickerson was here telling his story about how, um, how about the rescue of healthcare.gov and the subsequent founding of the U.S. Digital Service. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about technology, using technology for good. Um, and I will say, I never expected to be up here talking to you about this. I've been in the software business for a very long time, and I come straight out of the private sector, right? I was an engineer on the original Shockwave team, and I may be dating myself. We, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, we introduced animation to the web. Um, I helped launch Hulu. I, um, I ran BET Digital, and so, my code, my products have actually gone out to hundreds of millions of people, but I have never felt this way about what I've actually created and what I've been working on. Um, so in my wildest imagination, I never, when I got my bachelor's degree in computer science, I never thought, you know what? I'm going to help people change their lives and make their lives better. It wasn't something that ever crossed my mind. So it has had a profound impact on me, and I'm here to share it with you guys. So there is the Digital Coalition, and that's actually made up of uh, five independent organizations. So this actually started out of the Obama administration actually created uh, an initiative for smarter IT within government, and it's made up of the Office of the Chief Technology Officer of the United States of America, the Presidential Innovation Fellow Program. Uh, there is 18F, which is a kind of digital service agency, but within government. They're all government employees. And then there is the U.S. Digital Service Headquarters, which are the people that actually really kind of remove the roadblocks and myth bust and make things be able to move forward. And then there is the USDS agency team. So I'm one of those. I'm uh, leading the initiative at the Department of Education. And we are basically embedded at the agencies and partnering with the agencies to figure out how we can actually make stuff work. So it's an independent uh, set of organizations that we work together collaboratively. We're aligned to actually try to use digital services and technologies to improve the way government serves the American people. And not just kind of at the broad level, but actually at an individual level to try to actually reach and help individuals and, and specific people. So what we are is um, we're trying to use, we're trying to bring the same, the same things that you guys have used for the last decade in software and product development to bear in government services. So we are starting where people are literally dying for want of services. So we're, in, we're helping with health care. Uh, we're helping improve service benefits to veterans. We are streamlining how people immigrate to the U.S. We're trying to open the doors to higher education for the most vulnerable, vulnerable populations. Uh, and we're out there trying to actually work with the agencies to figure out the services that are going to have the biggest impact on the largest number of people. So I'm going to talk a little bit, a little recap on healthcare.gov. I'm sure you guys all heard about uh, the rescue or the subsequent rescue. Um, and this whole organization was actually founded, um, the, the, the idea was started, was kind of born out of this idea of the rescue of healthcare.gov, right, where they took a small group of private sector folks, parachuted them in to see what they could accomplish in a short amount of time. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is so critical and so important. So before the Affordable Care Act, there were 48 million people without health care. And 45,000 of them were dying literally just for want of health care insurance. So that was one in 1,000 people were dying every calendar year. You all know, healthcare.gov launched, not to great success. An ad hoc team came jumped in. It was seven people. They were there for six weeks. Before they started, they were enrolling 150 people each day. By the time they left, it was 150,000 per day. And the end result, at the end of the open enrollment period, uh, March 31st, they had actually gotten the final tally was 8.1 million people were registered. And the projections had actually only estimated 7 million. And this year in 2015, 10.2 million. So you can see that it's crucial and critical, this kind of stuff, the work that we're doing. 
Um, when they got there, it took an average of 20 minutes to complete an application, and the worst case application took 76 screens. By the time they left, it was a nine minute average and 16 screens for the worst case. Now, the biggest culprit was actually uh, the login system. And uh, so after they got everything stabilized and set up, they decided to actually attack that. It was responsible for the largest number of errors, and the original system cost $200 million to build and was supposed to have an annual operating expense of $70 million just to operate and maintain it. Uh, the response rate, as you can see, was uh, max response rate was five seconds. Not so good. Um, so what they did was, when they had a free moment, uh, they rebuilt the login system from scratch. It took six months, $4 million to build. It'll cost less than $4 million to operate. Um, the response time, as you can see, is at a max of 20 milliseconds. And in fact, they actually don't know what the capacity is because it broke the load testing system. So um, this is a real world, now infamous example about how tech has directly affected people's lives and helped save lives. The next example is actually around immigration. Some of you may be familiar, there is a form called the I-90, which is uh, an application to renew and replace your green card. It gets six million applications per year. It is entirely paper priced And uh, it, there's a whole ecosystem that's built around it, right? Which is taking advantage of people who don't know how to do it. And so there's lawyers and all kinds of people who are like, if you pay me, I can help escort you through the system. Um, so the goal was to actually put it online, make it more efficient. USCIS spent seven years and $1.2 billion getting it set up, and it failed. There was a study that actually said that, uh, an independent study that said that they had actually made the process worse and less efficient than paper, which I don't know how you do that. <laughs> um, so what did they do? They were like, we got to fix this. So they decided that they were this time going to have a 10-year contract sign up for $2.5 billion, and for the record, use the same vendor as first time. <laughs> so what is the definition of crazy? It is, of course, doing the same thing over again and expecting different results. Uh, wiser minds prevailed, and uh, the CIO at USCIS, in conjunction with the Digital Coalition, actually helped uh, reboot the idea and start over. So they did things like they moved from waterfall to agile, they moved to the public cloud. They implemented real-time monitoring. Oh, and they left the building and did user research like in the field and talked to people. <laughs> Shocking. Um, so over the course of several months, uh, they successfully launched an online system to handle replacement green cards. Um, and the new online version allows uh, users to track their progress, to get notifications. And already f over 40,000 people have filed online. So the last example is actually College Scorecard, which was my project. Um, and so I'm currently the Chief Digital Service Officer at the Department of Education. I'm going to talk a little bit about why the College Scorecard was so important and why a college degree is so important. So getting a college degree is the surest path to the middle class. So for millennials ages 25 to 32, the unemployment rate for somebody with a bachelor's degree is 3.8%. If you only have a high school diploma, it's 12.2%. There are studies that say that a degree from a four-year institution will earn you a million dollars more in your lifetime. And most importantly, 21.8% of people in that age range who only have a high school diploma live in poverty. So clearly very important. And the president wanted to actually create a tool to help students so they could understand the value that a school could provide to them and also enable them to make more informed choices and not get ripped off, most importantly. Uh, so as leader of this, the first thing we had to do was we had to figure out uh, what we needed to build to achieve that goal. We had to understand how students actually search for colleges. So we went out and asked them. Um, for the record, I have been in government five whole months. Uh, and this project started kind of the day I got there on the ground. Um, and I was like, I was there four days. I 
from New York. I'd been in DC for four days, and I was like, I was getting antsy. I was like, I gotta talk to students, I gotta talk to students. Where can I find some students? Gotta find some students, because I don't know anybody in DC. And somebody on my team was like, hey, well, there'll be students at the mall. And I was like, oh, that's genius. The mall, where the kids hang out, where the stores and all that. And she was like, um, no, the thing outside of the building that has the Washington Mall. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's smart, too. <laughs> so uh, we did. We went outside and actually uh, started accosting people as they came out of the Air and Space Museum. Uh, turns out it was spring break. It was perfect. We ended up talking to people from Nebraska and Wyoming and Wisconsin, um, 4-Hers. It was, it, was it was a great idea. Uh, we also, people write letters to the president, and we got to read them and then actually speak to a few of them, both guidance counselors and students. We actually also went to Anacostia High School, which is a public high school in D.C. Uh, that's who's in the photo. It's a guidance counselor and two of his students. And so really, we actually went and talked to them twice. So actually getting to engage with them and understanding kind of what it was that they were looking for, how a guidance counselor might use the tool, and versus how students might use the tool. So again, normal practices that y'all would think about using, but that were pretty unusual from a government perspective. So what we decided to do in order to reach our goal was to build two different products. Um, the first is we built a consumer tool, which you can see here. Uh, we built it mobile first. Uh, we really captured what we got from the user research and kind of built it into this tool in terms of how people searched and what they were looking for. Um, but I would actually argue that more importantly, we built an API. So the idea was to actually change the conversation um, within the ecosystem and not necessarily just provide a consumer-facing tool. We wanted to, this is actually what our password was, set the data free. Um, and so we built an API so that would enable other people, other people who wanted to build tools, developers, anybody who wanted to take the data and do something with it, and hopefully that they would actually create new products to serve niche audiences, hopefully the vulnerable audiences that need this information, like low-income students, first-generation college goers. So that was really, really crucial and critical to us in terms of what we chose to build. Which, um, so what we built was the consumer tool on top of the API as a reference implementation. And I believe that is one of the first times the government has actually dog-fooded their own API. So that was a lot of fun. Um, we launched an MVP four weeks ago. The rollout has been really successful. Uh, the president actually announced it during his weekly address, which was amazing. We got a ton of press coverage. In the first four days, we got about eight times as much traffic and usage as the previous version had gotten in 12 months. Um, so data folks have loved it. People are having a, people are having a field day with it. It's great. And, and what I'm loving is, is seeing all the different places that it's popping up. So people, I've seen posts on, posts on Facebook of people who've actually kind of gone into the data and explored it and are using it to look at uh, gender inequity in pay using the earnings from 10 years after you started school at various colleges and alma maters, which I think is fascinating. Um, institutions are actually revisiting their data submissions for the first time because now all of a sudden there's light on them and people are actually looking at the data and it's being exposed. So people are like, well, how do I, that's wrong, how do I fix it? And it's all about data that they submitted. Uh, and again, most importantly to me is there are 11 organizations who are already using these data within their own tools. So I'm very excited and I look forward to having this data continue to be used, continue to be fleshed out there, uh, and to get it into the hands of students and, con uh, students and consumers and guidance counselors. So I could go on. There are many, many examples. Uh, top three right here are around uh, veterans' medical health records interoperability. You guys know that this is a critical issue. There are 8 million veterans, 163 hospitals, 135 nursing homes. 25% of the nation is potentially eligible for VA services, so that includes veterans and families and survivors. 60% of doctors use VA's electronic health record system, so it's really critical that we figure out how to actually get systems to talk to each other so that medical records can follow you around. Another example, which is, again, like, I'm just trying to show you the broad range that tech can be used for. Um, this is a police data initiative. So this is um, uh, two presidential innovation fellows in the wake of Mike Brown and Eric Garner. Um, they wanted to see how they could actually help the national dialogue around policing reform. And so what they did was they actually created a system to collect and publish data 
and to also get 21 jurisdictions involved to figure out how they could actually use it to drive local dialogue and build community trust. Wide spectrum. Uh, the next one's actually called MapGive, which is the State Department's public diplomacy campaign to support open street mapping. Uh, on April 25th of this year, there was a 7.8 magnitude earthquake in Nepal. It, the, the quake itself, combined with tremors and aftershocks, killed five, over 5,000 people. And within 48 hours, there were 2,000 digital volunteers who actually mapped 13,000 miles of imagery, uh, three th identified 3,000 dam damaged buildings, and the idea was to actually get this information into the hands of first responders so they knew where there were roads blocked, where buildings were collapsed, where there was the most desperate need, and where they could actually access. So a broad swath of examples. Um, it really is about being able to do the greater good. How are we doing it? It's not rocket science. It's all methodologies and practices that you guys are familiar with. Um, we are bringing those things that have been in use to bear on massive scale problems, and it's bearing fruit. So we're doing simple things, right? Product management, software development processes, so goal setting, success criteria, using modern technology stacks, user-centered design, iteration, open data, open source, design patterns, monitoring and dashboards. One of the things that I think has been most critical in this process is actually around doing myth-busting and removing roadblocks. Um, you'll be amazed at the things that you hear in government, right? Which is, the cloud is illegal. We can't use it. <laughs> illegal. Uh, can't do usability testing. A-B testing, no, no, that's verboten. Um, agile, illegal. Uh, so all of these things have been tackled in various different ways by different, various different groups. One in particular I'll tell you about is the Agile Marketplace. So this is a marketplace that was actually created so that um, people, agencies could actually select from vendors that had already been approved, that had already gone through a certain vetting. Um, and so rather, and I think it was really ingenious the way they developed this, right? Which is rather than fill out like a 500 page document saying, I swear I'm agile, I swear I am build modular, uh, they actually made them put their money where their mouth was and gave them a week to build a product. And they actually had to check it into GitHub, it had to be open source. Uh, and I will say, not everybody uh, who has a government contract was successful at this. Uh, and so it really did uh, allow us to winnow out the people who were going to be able to succeed at it. And you will actually see that a bunch of the vendors um, had to really uh, take a new initiative and a new path to try to achieve this. And you know, that's the whole point, is we actually are trying to foment, foment change across the entire ecosystem. So all that to say, those are the tools that we're using and basically anything that we think might work. I mean, it's, it's really the great unknown. You get thrown into a problem and you try to figure it out and solve it and nobody's done it yet. And so that's what we're here for. Uh, I will say that we are making a change that's gonna impact millions and millions of people's lives. And the, the power that that has and, and the feeling that it gives you in terms of actually being able to really, really help individuals and millions of them at any given time is just a tremendous feeling. But we need help. We need recruits. We need smart people on the ground who want to do this. And again, having come from private sector, not something I ever thought I would be doing, but it's a tremendous thing. So please, if you're interested, check us out. Come join us. Thank you.